Peter Fosel, welcome to the executive talk. We meet in St. Gallen, uh, where you're very involved at the university. Uh, they have a symposium every year, and this year uh, was marked by the question, what are the jobs of the future? What is the future of work? If you think back of your early days, when you were 20, or if you were 20 now, would you like to be 20 and a student and, and uh, having the whole work life ahead of you? Yeah, I think there are two answers here. On the one side, I'm very happy where I am. Um, great career, and now I've got more time to also give back, as I say, apart from being involved still in, in, uh, in business life. But going back to 20 and have the whole life and the whole world in front of me, I would also do that because I like challenges, I like learning, and I like to grow uh, as a person, but also together maybe with a company um, or with some um, team members. So I would also take that challenge, but I'm, quite, I'm happy where I am. So. But if you look at the younger generation now, you're turning 60 this year, and if you look at the 20-year-olds now, do they have it easier or is it harder for them? If you look at their working environment, at their job uh, uh, possibilities, for example? I think it's harder today. I think back when we had to find our first job... Um, it was no problem, right? No problems. Actually, we could choose. Um, today, this is different. You have to go through these assessment centres. You have to apply for jobs. Uh, a lot is electronically, so a, th a few thousands of applicants come in. Uh, they fall out of it, so um, you just go through the, the treadmill there. Uh, so I think it's much harder. On the other side, I have to say, I see the young people much better prepared. So if I compare myself to those who are 20, 25 today, they are much more grounded in the world. They, are more, they have more self-confidence, etc. I didn't have that, and also we didn't have that. Uh, it was just a different preparation for the professional life back Why is then. That? Did, you, did you lack in confidence? Did you lack in, in, in experience? Uh, wasn't the world as big as, as it is now and, and full of opportunities uh, as it is now? Yeah, I think obviously technology plays a role, so we have much more information today. I think the globalization also shows here. Uh, uh, you are much more networked today, you have much more knowledge. Um, I think you are kind of educated and trained much earlier uh, to be more outgoing, to, uh, to stand in front of, of um, let's say, your classmates or etc. and to do presentations. It's much more outgoing and there's more information. I think the, the younger students today, they want to learn more and faster. I think we enjoy student life much more. Today I hear a lot, now I have to go as fast as possible through. I think we were all proud back then to have maybe a sabbatical somewhere and take it a little bit slower. So I see the pace already uh, today uh, around the university here as well uh, at a much higher, higher level. So. Does that mean they, they lack sometimes a little bit of a kind of a life experience as well, that being a student, you, you, maybe it's, it's, it's good not to work all the time. Maybe it's good to, to have a party from time to time. Do you see that as a, as a kind of uh, something that lacks also with the young generation, that they're almost too focused now? I think yes, and I think the academic as well as the vocational training, I think over time have to have much more practical time in it. So taking a year off and actually go out and work in companies, do internships, or do your own, uh, what is very common in Anglo-Saxon areas, you do your gap year, you work for a charity somewhere far away from, from your home. I think that grounds you much better, uh, gives you more experience, and the world is not only theoretical, the world is actually extremely practical, and that, that would be my criticism today, that uh, there's too much emphasis on school, uh, on, on really um, education in terms of in the classroom, and I would prefer ha to have the, the youngsters actually much more in the real life or real world, and then go back to maybe have another year of study, etc. Exactly, like you did. I mean, you, 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 well, I you left that, school, yes. you, you did an apprenticeship at yeah. 16. Uh, you never regretted that? No, absolutely not. So I still remember when I was 15 years old, I came home and said to my parents, I don't think I can learn anything anymore at school, so I want to go and work. How did they react? They were quite shocked about it because they saw me actually going to, um, let's say, the gymnasium and then obviously later on to, uh, to the university. 
But then I, I did this, uh, but I realized after three years that my rucksack is not fully loaded. And hence I went back then to, um, to study for three years after having worked another year, and then went back and studied for three years. And I felt and still feel today that this mixture of having practical experience and then also theoretical experience and then mix mixing that, that was for me absolutely ideal. Uh, the right formation to, to tackle the challenges you had back then. When you look at the challenges that the young people are, 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 are uh, facing at the moment, I mean, uh, there's a lot of talk about automation, about uh, uh, digitalization, about the new revolution or evolution at, at least. Um, if you take yourself as an example, are you ready for the changes to come? Are you aware of everything that's that's happening? Uh, are you are you confident enough that you're you're able to tackle them? I think that it would be a lie if I say yes, I'm completely prepared. I think during the last 30, 35 years of my professional life, I've learned to constantly learn. Yeah. Um, I've developed a curiosity. Uh, to be interested in new things and I do like technology, I do like to be on top of it and um, I'm still learning and if you look at digital and all what's happening out there, um, I wouldn't say I'm an absolute specialist, uh, I know enough but I'm, st I'm learning but I think I know enough in order to help to define a strategy for a company when I'm chair of uh, like ABB or I sit on the board of a tech company, and that's how I add to my knowledge, to my experience, and then can use that knowledge and transform that into leadership skills, which you need at those levels, because you are not the absolute specialist, but you are leading your teams, your staff, to deliver the best value for, for themselves and the company. Has that changed, your leadership style, with everything that changes around it? I mean, with all these challenges, are you still the same leader as you were 10, 20 years ago? I think I'm much more experienced. I'm calmer today. I was never emotional in that sense. But my early formation helped me in that. Be, be, having been out in the practical world early helped me also uh, to take a very practical approach to solve problems. And that has kind of been with me during my professional career. You're a hands-on, a practical. I, I'm a hands-on, but also I always try to form the best teams around me because I'm really convinced that you deliver through the teams you have around you. It's not just about you. It is about the company, it is about the teams around you because they deliver at the end of the day the value. You lead them, you steer them, but it's wrong to believe that it is only because of you because that's not how uh, a company of the size of an ABB, et cetera, works. Uh, of course, that's, that's what a lot of leaders say and a lot of CEOs and, 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 and chairmen say. But I that think I have practiced it. If you would ask my staff, they, they would always tell you that I have a very inclusive style. And not a big ego. No, I don't. That's a, a word which I don't use, and I don't practice in that sense. I mean, uh, the, the press said so as well. They they called you once. The, I think the the, the the quiet giant of the Swiss economy, uh, someone who was highly successful, yet very modest. Very. Uh, I mean, we, we we hardly saw you, as you say yourself. Uh, we hardly saw you um, uh, losing your temper, for example. You're 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 still a very. Uh, Hands-on guy as well. Uh, how did you keep that? I mean, is it is it isn't isn't there a risk of, of of taking off with all the success? I think the risk is there. I always tried uh, to tell myself this is not about me. This is about the company I'm serving. The company will be around for another 125 years, I hope, uh, and therefore I'm just the steward of a few years. And all what I do needs to be uh, in line and the best for the company, that's the one side. And then I think the other side, I always really kept private life and business life apart. And I had a very great family, great kids, a great wife, and that's where I grounded over the weekends again, and I was just a normal person, and that helped me uh, to kind of drive the companies I was leading in a very different way, despite the fact that the doors are open to you to really become very egocentric, 
but I was never interested in that because I really wanted the best for the company and the best for myself and the families. It's quite interesting that that split life in a way that uh, I mean you say it yourself it's quite a quite a normal family life you 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 live in the countryside uh, you don't live in a fancy uh, town or, or, or uh, in, in, in in too much luxury yet uh, you were head of, of, of Shell you were uh, back then uh, so at least the press says the the, the highest paid uh, manager in Europe you will correct me if that's not uh, true, but isn't there kind of a dilemma there as well? That you know, you said there yourself that you, you you don't consider yourself part of the elite, but only with your salary you were part of the elite. Yes, uh, undoubtedly, if you at that time Shell was the biggest company in Europe as well, uh, one of the biggest in the world. Therefore, you are part of the elite, but it is what you make out of that. You didn't feel like yeah. part of the elite um, because, as I said, for me. Who opens the doors for a CEO? Is it the CEO himself or herself? Or is it actually the institution they work for? And I always said, I'm the ambassador of 100,000 Shell people or 135,000 um, uh, ABB people. And I'm only their ambassador to, to represent them outside, lead them strategically. Uh, it's not because of me. Uh, and I think that helped me to ground myself. And then I was never a public figure. I never was. Uh, hugely in the press, nor when I was doing well, and you have times where it doesn't go that well. I try to stay clear of that because, again, it was not about me, it was about the company, and that helped me really to split it, the life as well, but also have, um, have a normal life as a CEO. Having said that, do you think modesty and that kind of low keyness that you that you allude to are those the most important assets for a, for a leader, for a CEO, for a, for a chairman? It may not work for everybody. It depends on the culture of the company as well. Some companies need very uh, need big figures at the top because that's just the culture they have. Now I grew up in a culture which was the shell culture, a little bit mixed with the ABB culture, and that's not where you will find egocentric type of um, leaders because the base culture is very different. Uh, and especially Shell obviously gave me 30 years of professional life and that's the culture you will adopt. And the culture there, it is really not about the person, it is not about personalities. There is a lot of Dutchness in that company. The Dutch are very similar to the Swiss. Mm -hmm. They like They're known to be modest as well. Modest. So, yeah. so, and uh, that really formed me as well. So. Now we're in the board of ABB. You worked for ABB before. Now, as a, as a board member, as, as the chairman, how much can you influence the culture of the company? I mean, is it, is it up to you to give those rules, to give those benchmarks, to give those, those limits as well? Um, I, I would say the CEO form has much more influence on the, on the culture. Uh, the chair plus the board, uh, they can certainly help to set the right tones, the right behaviours, etc. But in the, as we are not in the day-to-day -day business, it is much more set by the CEO and the management. But there is also a culture which has been a long time with these companies. Uh, it takes quite a while until a culture is being changed. So it would take four to six years maybe just to get some changes into a culture. So. Even uh, a CEO, maybe there for five, six, seven years, may bring some changes. But I think the base elements of the culture will actually remain, irrespective of who leads it at the end of the day. Speaking of that day-to-day -day business of, of a CEO and, and you being a little bit further away from, from, from the daily executive uh, work, you, you, you were in that game a long time. And then one of the reasons why you, you quit Shell was to have a little bit of freedom back, to have a little bit more of your family. Now that you're a, you're, you're, you're a member of the board, uh, do you enjoy that freedom? Do you, do you feel, do you feel yeah. happier in a way? I, I think it was a very con conscious decision. Uh, after 10 years in the Shell board, five as finance chief and five as CEOs, uh, to take a, a step out of the, the daily treadmill as a, as a CEO at the end, uh, to become a non-executive, because I also wanted to have time um, to give things back. Uh, so what I have as experience in my rucksack, I pass on, like here at the university to the youngsters, um, to the organization which works for women in the US, where I'm also part of. And uh, that gives me a lot of satisfaction now. But I would not go as far as I'm now happier with the set of uh, tasks I have now. 
you know, I'm as happy as before because these are different things. So when you make the step, uh, then it has to be a very conscious decision because life is different. I mean, you are no longer in the front line, so the, you are no longer the one who everybody needs an answer and a decision from. Now you are more a, a conductor uh, of a very big orchestra rather but than... less actually, in the limelight yeah, as well. Yeah, as less in the limelight, etc. So it's very different, but I enjoy that uh, because I can now do various things. So I'm on four boards and they're all in very different areas, but they're all in industries which will make a difference to mankind. And that's what I was looking for, so. Is that kind of a, maybe a, a, an unconscious decision as well that since you had so much success and since you were, you were highly paid, as we said, is there almost some kind of duty to give back to society or to, to, to industries that you had, to put, it, to put it that way? I mean, did you almost have a, have a bad conscience by, by, by just taking? Do you have to give afterwards? No, not at all. I, I, I tell you a story. So, when I announced that I will step down from Shell, I was 55, uh, after 30 years uh, at Shell, uh, a colleague, an old colleague from Shell, called me actually and said, you are the only person who after 25 years actually does what he said yeah. he will do. Yeah. Because I and told, isn't forced to go yeah, as well. And right? I have told this guy, actually this colleague, when I was 30 years old, that I will stop at 55. I couldn't remember that anymore, but it was actually true. So it, it was always in my mind to split my life into three parts, which is young, students, working, fun. I played football, as you know, uh, etc. That was all fine. Then I worked hard for 30 years. And now I hope I can give back for 30, 35 years um, of what I have learned. I still learn myself, but also give back. I always saw the life in, in three pieces. So. Mm -hmm. Is how big is the pressure in, in a position like that? You were, you were CFO uh, of ABB during the crisis. Yeah. And you once said it was a matter of hours before the, the, the money ran yeah. out. I mean, you were on the constant pressure there. I guess there were some sleepless nights involved there as well. Uh, did you ever feel that if this pressure goes on, I, I, I won't make it? Um, I was always convinced we will make it. It was a very hard time. But you have these hard times a few times during your career. Um, I think if it's not for years, so for five, four or five years, you, you can withstand this one. And especially when you distance yourself also from the emotional part. Because one thing is, when you are a very egocentric leader, it gets to you much faster than those who are calmer, have a distance, uh, they just, like myself, when I look in the mirror in the morning, I will go out and do the best what I can do. Uh, I, I'm not going to do the impossible. And that helped me to overcome these stress situations as well. But as I have to say, the first 18 months in my ABB time back in 2002, they were really hard, I have to say, because I felt the responsibility to have 150,000 people working for ABB. If you take this times three, because there are families and kids attached to it, we had a few thousands of suppliers attached to the company. They would all have had really hard time uh, with the bankruptcy of ABB. You feel that responsibility, but it's, it's not the responsibility of the pressure of the day, but it's the social responsibility which you feel as well. Now, is, you mentioned two, three times now the high salaries, etc. Everybody says um, you earn too much, blah, blah, blah. Does that bother this. you, honestly? No, it doesn't bother me because I earn what they pay me uh, and uh, I think I do a good job for that. Um, but it's the social, um, emotional bit which, yeah, which for me was always something I had to discuss and think through because it is a huge responsibility at the end of the day. I mean, at Shell, for example, we had 100,000 people for shell working, 350,000 in retail sites, and there are roughly half a million people working on projects for shell. So that was a million people. Now, if you strategically mismanage this company, there's a million people working for you, plus the families behind. So these are tremendous responsibilities, and that's how I always felt. It's my job to make sure uh, that they all come to work in the morning and go safely home in the evening with a job in their hands. So, um, 
with that responsibility comes, uh, as we said, a, a reward, a pay. Uh, managers are often criticised for that. However, if you look at, uh, you said it yourself, you're a big football fan, you're a big uh, Champions League fan. If you look at someone like Ronaldo or Messi, who's, who's paid more than, than, than your average CEO and, and, and chairman, uh, do you feel, sometimes feel that, wh why aren't they criticised as well? Because they, they, they get all the money they deserve or not, but they're, 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 they're highly paid as well. Or do you just think... Look, this is fair I, enough. I think it's fair enough. It's entertainment. They have the 90 minutes. If they play a great game, nobody cares how much they earn at the end of the day. If we, after one year, um, or two years, or three years, the stock exchange had a crisis, stock prices come down, you may have done a brilliant job, but it, it shows in a different way uh, because everybody looks at the share price, etc. I always took a much longer term view. And, this is typically when you work for an oil and gas companies, uh, company because your projects have 30, 40 years lifetime. So whatever I have done during my time was not for my successor, it was actually for the next two successors. And that gives you a certain different perspective to these things. So I measure myself in a different way, quite immune to media critics or shareholder critics. I do the best thing for the company and with that, it's okay. And Ronaldo does the same. Federer does the same, but they have a game to play and then they, you see the immediate outcome. That's not the case in our, in our business. So, but that's okay. I have no problems. They can earn five times more. Well, that's fine. Let's stay with football for a minute. Uh, as an analogy, you, you, were, you were a defender. Would you say that's, that's typical for you, that you were not the Ronaldo? You were, you know, in your business life, you weren't that, that ego. You weren't the one always in the limelight. In that regard, did, did, did that football position actually match the position you had in, in your business life as well? Yeah, I played as a defender and also midfield. Oh, OK. And, so, and, but also as a, bit a defender. more offensive as well. I like then, to yeah. have stuff in front of me yeah. <laughs> so I can direct and I can steer people. Uh, and I don't need the limelight of scoring a goal and then being celebrated. That's not my style. I like to deliver on an ongoing basis and get the reward uh, over time that I had a constantly good performance rather than a one-off performance because I scored two goals, scored two goals and then uh, a dry season for the rest of the season. But, but so I, I, for me, it was always the team which was important and directing the team. So I was many years captain as well. So that is more my game. So. You, you, you're, you're very much into sports. In the winter, you're in the mountains. Uh, as I said, you, you, you like football. In that way, did, did sports teach you something, not only like to be a, a team player, but also other, other values that you would try to give, give over as well to, you know, in, in, into your corporation, into your business? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I use the sport a lot as an example as well. Um, because if you have, a, especially team sport, uh, because I think in a team, it's not every game that the same player is the one who's, who saves the game or who scores or the, the goalkeeper, actually, if he has a, a great day, he can also save the team. So what I always liked is I, it's the team which really um, has to work together and it doesn't matter who performs on a certain day, it is still the team performance, the company performance which will count. That's one way I looked at it. When I looked at it from a coaching point of view as a CEO, I always said, look guys, I'm happy to be your coach at the sideline and I direct you. You will perform because I like that you take the accountability for your business. But be always aware that I can also be a player coach. I can also come to the field and that would signal to you that your business is not doing well because I need to step in. So I use these type of examples a lot. So sport for me and business has a lot of commonalities at the end. If we take that analogy one, one step further, and if you look at ABB at the moment, uh, where are on the league table? Because there, there, there are challenges. Uh, the, 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 um, the stock weren't as, 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 as people would hope. Uh, the SMI is one of the, the weaker uh, titles uh, this year. Uh, where would you place yourself? Are you, are you midfield? Are you more like at the bottom of the, at, of the table? I think from an ABB perspective, we have had the last few years of bringing what I call the house in order. So we restructured, we had to say goodbye to a, a few people. Um, we 
put four divisions with clear structures in, in place, or so the management, the CEO did that, with the support of the board. So we have done the homework. It was also a period where there were very strong headwinds from an economic point of view. And ABB is more of a late cycle business rather than an early mid cycle business. Hence, we had to wait a while before the wind actually started to, to, to change. So I think we are well positioned strategically as well as operationally now. Not everything works. The so performance in Q4 was not where we wanted it to be. Q1 now was better. Now, the share price is an interesting uh, thing because, yes, this year our SMI performance is, is, uh, is not top, is lagging. Um, I never measure against SMI, I always measure against the competition out there. Now that we are not the last one, but we are also lagging there. And if you do the same for last year, it would look differently. So I take a longer term perspective. Um, we have operationally not performed well in, in a, at ABB for the last five to ten years, if I may say so. We had to put uh, the base in order, strategically do some acquisitions, and I think we are now at the stage also uh, rebuilding the company into a more digital company that we should be now ready to uh, really uh, benefit from the change in the world economy as well. And we have the luxury, in my opinion, that we are in the two big trends of this world. We are a leading company. All of our businesses are now either number one or two in the world. So we should capture that. So it's the energy revolution on one side, and it's the industrial, the digital, the, the fourth, um, revolution side. And I think, uh, so it's all there now. We have to perform, so it's about performing. Uh, we have the right ingredients, and now it's execution. Now we'll see how where this takes us the next um, uh, few few uh, years. I never measure in quarters, so as simple as that. Final question uh, from 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 the the years to come back to the years that were and back to the the 16 year old Peter Falls of uh, some years ago uh, when he looked at the 60 year old, almost 60 year old Peter Falls back then. Would he be happy? What become of him, or what become you know in in a professional life of him? I think the 16 years old would be very happy, uh, surprised, because I never had that as my, uh, my goal. But I think it's two times happy. And the first one, and the more important one for me, is the private side. Um, married for a long time, uh, happy family, kids with partners, and uh, our grandchild as well. We lived 30 years abroad, 20 years plus abroad, and it all worked out. So I'm very happy on that side. I think professionally, I have achieved more than I ever uh, had, uh, had dreamt of. So uh, becoming CEO of Shell, becoming now chairman of, uh, of ABB, uh, for me, this was unthinkable when I was 16, even when I was 30. So I'm um, very happy with that. So, so far, so good. A content man. Yes, you can say that, yes. Peter Fulzer, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, so great.